Hello, everybody. This is your stream host, Logic Hole, and we've got a special show for you tonight. We are going to be recording a live session of the Indie Game Riot podcast. I hope that you all uh, stay and enjoy it because this promises to be a lot of fun. I'm going to go ahead and bring on our guests here now. All right, and welcome to the show, everybody. I'll let you introduce yourself. So how about you just go in alphabetical order with Jashenya? All right, hey, everybody. My name is Jashenya. Uh, this is the Indie Game Riot. Uh, we've been doing the show for uh, about a month and a half now, and we've uh, mainly the goal of the show is to, is to really uh, support the indie game community, and uh, I'll pass it on over to my, my good pal, Rev. Uh, yep, yeah, my name is my name is Reverend. Everybody calls me that, uh, my my wife included. But uh, you know, we kind of got a little bit tired of the AAA scene and wanted to give back to the great people, the great community that is uh, that is you know provided us with so much entertainment and and joy through the years. So we decided we were going to hit this podcast. Normally, we would have somebody, our third co-host with us, uh, Takedo. Unfortunately, he's at the Origins Gaming Convention. And uh, in place of that, we have uh, Little Tin Man, Phil Royer, uh, here as a a guest host. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Phil. Hey, y'all. I am Phil Royer. Uh, You guys might remember me from, I think it was Tuesday night. Um, I'm the developer of Super Pixalo. Uh, So I talked a little bit about that Tuesday, and we're here to chill out and talk about games and Indie 3, and I I believe uh, a little later in the show we got a really cool guest. Oh, yeah. And uh, just to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about today, it's going to be, we're going to, we've got... uh, we're going to be talking about how the indie game uh, community has evolved the gaming industry. We're going to also spotlight some of the uh, some of our favorite games based on um, some of the more important aspects of indie games. And uh, like Phil said, we've got that very special interview at the end, so stay tuned for that. Um, first of all, though, uh, Rev, like, what has your what has been your your favorite indie three moment so far? Just curious. Honestly, my favorite Indie 3 moment so far has been the fact that there is an Indie E3. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I know that sounds like suck up at all, but uh, we were we were actually recording it for an episode uh, for next Monday's episode. And we were looking for news and we came across a link that was like, oh, hey, this is going to happen. And it was like, oh, awesome. So I've been hanging out. I've been, I've been helping out moderate with chat and, uh, you know, just kind of help it out where I can, passing information, the networking, just seeing so many great games, so much creativity and inspiration that has been going into things. And, uh, oh, sorry, we got uh, somebody typing like Matt there. Someone's keyboard is being picked up like oh, yeah. crazy. <laughs> nah, <that's all> right. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, um, so, like, honestly, the fact that this even is happening has is, is been the, the big one for me. Uh, but definitely the game showcase, the, uh, the panels last night, uh, or was it today? Yeah, it was today. There was that awesome panel on, uh, on, uh, indigenous, uh, keeping indigenous peoples in, in video games and how to do that with respect. And there's just been so much amazing. It, limiting it to one thing is impossible. Yeah. I, I got to say the, the, the amount of networking that's been going on in, since Indie 3 started is, is crazy. I got to say, we've met so many awesome, uh, so many awesome game devs and just and fans of indie gaming. And, uh, like you said last night, we, we met, um, uh, uh Beth. Oh, and, yeah. From, from the uh, Native American panel. And it was just really cool talking to her as, and, and getting all these tweets from indie devs wanting us to sh- share their games and everything like that. Uh, I, it's, it's just been pretty miraculous that uh, how, how quickly and how well this has come together. Definitely. Uh, uh, Bill, it, it, do you have any favorite moments? I mean, you, you got your interview, right? <laughs> oh yeah, that was, that was great. But actually my favorite moment has been just been able to, uh, see all these different indie games. Um, and even a few that, uh, I don't think we only did indie games. I think, I think there was a couple other ones that at least we talked about, but, um, it was great just to have like hours that we could just sit down and uh, so long could showcase all these fantastic video games that you know people in the community have made. People who are here, I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, because this was thrown together so quickly that um, 
most of the people who just found out about it over the weekend, which was when it started, are probably here watching. So we're all getting exposed to each other's games, styles, ideas, um, extremely exciting stuff. I mean, that's what that's what you should get out of the convention. And uh, it's exciting to be a part of this, even if it's online and far away. Uh, well, technically, it's far away. It's right here. In front of me, <laughs> it's, but... about a, it's about a, a 17 hour drive for me. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'm in I'm in Los Angeles County. I could have been at E3, but no. Yeah, always better. Well, you you had uh, Phil had the interview um, just to give him since he's on the show. He made the awesome game Super Pixalo, and you had a couple other questions for him that he didn't get he didn't get a chance to answer. I guess during the during the interview, uh, Rev. Yeah, like I, Phil, just a just a real quick was uh, why specifically did you design Super Pixalo for the Ouya first? Great question. Um, I can understand uh, how to how to answer this question. Um, I'm a big fan of the Ouya. I found out about it like I found out about it the day it went it launched. Um, like not when the Kickstarter launch, but the day it went on sale. Okay. Um, like, real late in the game, and I found out about that day, uh, I got, I ordered a used Dewey off of Amazon, got it later that week, and I was just like, this is super cool. Like, all of a sudden, I can, uh, I can, like, play all these games that are, you know, at the time, there was only, like, 50 games, maybe. And some of them were made by, like, just people like me. Individuals, you know, they they had spent, you know, like uh, Matt Thorson made Towerfall. Um, we had uh, other people who made Bomb Squad. Um, I can't remember everybody's names. I wish I I wish I could because they all deserve it. But Bomb Squad uh, was one of the first games. Me and Callie spent a lot of time playing. Uh, we spent a lot of date nights playing Bomb Squad and um, Hidden in Plain Sight. We spent. I mean, it's like local multiplayer. There was a lot of those. And then some single player stuff. Um, can't remember many names specifically because uh, right now there are over eight hundred games on it, uh, which is a ton. Uh, yeah. But why I went for that first was because I was coming from doing HTML5 web games, and um, I had I had started meeting some developers who had done PC indie PC stuff. Meeting meaning uh, connecting and watching their Twitter feeds and stalking and stuff like that. Um, not necessarily face to face, but like learning more about like other indie games, indie games in um, in the you know indie online community. That's kind of worldwide, so it's not like a specific region or anything. But um, and like I was just starting to get introduced like itch.io and all those kind of things, and I I just to me it felt polluted. And I wanted to go to something less polluted than the web game market, which is insanely polluted. Well, there's so um, much there's so much in the web game market because one oh, of our yeah. normal segment, one of our one of our normal segments on the show is is spotlighting a free indie game, but we never we never pick up those ones that you see on a lot of times on like armor games where it's just mm -hmm. licensed. For it's like grounds, the same yeah. licensed game yep. every single time, like like some tower defense or something like that. Yeah, um, but there, not there's the, thousands of those. Like it's yeah. not just the ones on there. There are sites that are like, and I put, I put the original HTML5 uh, game Pixalo, which is a very a dumbed fun, down yeah. version of it, on on a couple of the sites, and I got like a couple thousand people playing them, uh, and like of those were like twenty of my friends, and it, it just felt very impersonal. Um, it a little bit of feedback, but mostly it, it just felt impersonal, and I didn't, I didn't want that, and I saw that kind of personality. That uh, more of a closer community in the Ouya community, um, and that's still there today with the Ouya forum, with the you know people over at Ouya Central, Ouya Brew, uh, everybody at Ouya. It's very much about community and and the people around you and 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 helping each other get your games up there, um, and I like that. So it's a great place to put a game and kind of try it out. Um, and get some, you know, excitement built up around it, polish it, um, or you, you could just leave it there, or you could, like I'm doing, I now have it on Steam, uh, a green light, and it's, I uh, think, after this week, it's like 27% green light, uh, much thanks to um, the interview on Tuesday, and also Hashbang, Hashbang Games, been helping me out with uh, strategy, 
Um, you're releasing you're releasing the soundtrack too, right? Oh yeah, tonight I should mention. Actually, I'll here I'll first link put a link to the Steam Greenlight page. Please. Which I, I highly recommend you guys do. Like just just having watched Phil's tra- trailer when it was showcased the other day, and then playing Pixalo, um, you know, last night at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun. I, I anxiously look forward to it. I, I regret that I don't have an Ouya already, uh, just for this game. So I've already green lighted it, uh, or green lit. You, and, you, uh, you, it's not green lighted yet. <laughs> <laughs> it is in my book. <laughs> so so go check it out and, and definitely. Um, there's and then, the, the clickable link. And then the Super Pixalo soundtrack I'm releasing for sale on uh, tonight. And now you can go buy it. Um, I work with Saad Ali of Reckoning Storm Audio Works. We've been working together over the last few weeks to um, to extend the soundtrack. So a lot of the songs were like 30-second loops. And so we added two extra songs on there and made uh, the rest of the tracks two-and-a-half-minute songs uh, to three-minute songs. So, like, they're really good. Um, Saad did an incredible job. Uh, so you can yeah. now get that whole soundtrack. Uh, I think you can like get it for uh, oh yeah five bucks, five bucks. Um, lossless quality or MP3, whatever suits your uh, your flavor. Uh, make sure you hit that greenlit thing and uh, and and yeah. Um, did that answer the Ouya question? Yeah, it kind of did. Okay. I, like, yeah. Just to kind of kind of kind of sum it up, it was it was basically um, you were you. You wanted a a slightly closer knit, less less filled place mm-hmm. to to release it and, and get feedback and stuff like that. So no, it, it it totally makes sense. And and like I said, I I regret the fact that I don't have an Ouya just because of this game. I love this style and, of game. And and speaking of, you were mentioning the the Ouya community and everything like that. That actually kind of brings me on to, the, to what we're going to talk about next a little bit. Um, in in the beginning, uh, when we first introduced ourselves, I mentioned the amount of networking and everything like that. But the indie game community as a whole, but especially so far in Indie 3, everyone has been so... There's so much camaraderie and everyone's been so supportive of each other. Um, and there's so much respect in one, among one another. It's it's, it's really impressive and, and it, 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 it tickles... It tickles my insides. I'm, I'm all fuzzy inside for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that actually uh, leads into the discussion about how uh, the, how indie games, indie gaming uh, has has evolved the gaming community as a whole, you know, and starting with starting with that uh, the community aspect of it. I don't think you'll ever see any community among any of the AAA games as close as indie gaming is. Well, we were. <laughs> Go ahead, Phil. Let me jump. Yeah, let me cut in for a moment. In actually, mm-hmm. sure. Uh, looks like we have another guest here. I'll bring him in. Oh, hello, Indie oh, Box James? James. Yep, that's our Indie Box James. That, he's uh, yeah, he's actually due for uh, he's actually due for later in the show. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm ruining the surprise. <laughs> well, I guess his name has been on the list already. So yeah. Oh, no, yeah, it's no, fine. Okay, no big deal. All right, now back to your regularly <laughs> scheduled programming. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so so how uh how 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 has indie gaming um you know starting with the community aspect um really evolved the the gaming industry well okay so going back in the day like I, i'm i'm going to kind of break my my own policy of not really talking about triple a games during uh during igr but you know back in the day there was a lot of really cool mmos we were talking about some last night you know ultima online and it those were I'm kind of aging myself here. Back in the day, there was a lot of community that built up around games. <laughs> Back in my day, get off my lawn. Yeah. Uh, but there, there was a lot of community. You had people that that were making lifelong friendships, and and you know, this is even as far as as single player games. You had people that would get together, and and you would all you know meet up in each other's basement or or, or the living room, and you'd be 
playing Quake together because the internet, whatever. Um, <laughs> and, and and so like there there was that really big sense of community that was always a part of it. And then like I don't want to hash on one of my favorite games of all time, but then Xbox Live came out with Halo Two and the multiplayer the the get together and game with each other feeling just kind of disappeared like it's now you know me here in california and my my friends over in in my old home state you know and we're playing into we we can't rib each other the way we used to there's none of this like oh hey somebody's up and getting a soda or a beer out of the fridge grab me one too and you know screw you get your own beer type stuff and so for me, that last that that loss of community has, has really changed my whole perception towards gaming. And I've found that reinvigorated in the indie game community itself. You know, not not just you know here at, at Indie Three, but in, in general. You know, I'm I'm playing games and commenting on forums, and I'm going to Game Jolt and and talking with developers and and other people that are playing these games, and we're passing recommendations back. And hey, what did you think about this mechanic in that game? And it's it's really become it's it's really become a, a a a new community for me. It brings back that joy of gaming that got me into gaming to begin with. That's uh, ultimately the the indie community is the only reason I'm still playing games now, and I'm 32 years old. So, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, I'm the old man here. <laughs> no, uh, well, Phil, you um, I mean, you have a little bit of a different perspective, which I'm, which is one thing that's really cool about having you on the show because Rev and I have have. Little to no, and, and I'm the one with zero <laughs> knowledge of, of game uh, game coding, but you have a different perspective of um, how the indie community has worked and how indie games in general have have really shaped um, indie game or just gaming uh, in the most recent years. Um, so, what do you what do you think about it? How, how do I think it's shaped it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not totally sure. Uh, I've only. It was only a year and a half ago I learned about um, that indie games even existed. Um, I'd never heard of even any of the mainstream ones. And so... What what got you into it then? um, Indie Game the Movie, actually. I I started programming some web game stuff, and then in, I think it was April last year, uh, somebody somewhere recommended... I check out indie game the movie or maybe it was like i stumbled across it on netflix or something that's how i found it and i watched it and i was blown away and i watched it uh 16 more times before summer uh <laughs> i've now watched it over 30 times uh my steam i got it on steam too and now it just tracks how many hours i've wasted watching any of the movie <laughs> not wasted though it's not wasted i've spent over 80 hours on there um you're the guy just sitting there, just repeating the lines. It is, for right? Yeah, you. I just stare there and drool and drink beer and stuff like <laughs> that. Um, but uh, that's, yeah. Uh, so I don't have I don't have a good opinion because I I really haven't been there for like a lot of the progress. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know what. I honestly don't know what what uh, what the progress has been, other than. Um, other than I think that being able to jump into it, you know, just from like the limited experience I had doing web stuff and then jumping in and being like, oh, whoa, then there's this whole kind of almost underground community, almost underground. Right. Uh, where everybody kind of everybody kind of wants to help each other. I wouldn't say everybody wants to help each other because, I, I mean, we're all human and we're all, you know, we have our, our corruptions and our, our bad sides, but we have our good sides. And, right. and but. I feel like the indie game community is a little more open to recognizing everyone as humans than than other industries. Not even game industries, but other mm-hmm. industries. We're not just consumers and providers. We're people exploring ideas. I think that's super cool. That's why I'm yeah. here. That's why I want to be a part of this. And I, I think, too, that indie games uh, obviously have a lot more freedom than, you know, say, AAA games. Because AAA games, there's a mold that they want to fit. They're, they're very rarely wanting to uh, take that chance a, on, a, on an experimental game. 
something that's controversial. Uh, so indie games, you know, you're not you're not you're not constrained by by those you know those limitations that they put on you. Um, and I think I think that has created a, like a new whole set of expectations for gamers about about games. And I think AAA will eventually have to catch up with that. I don't know if they're el- they'll ever really get to the point where uh, indie games have where they can just do whatever they want because you know they have PR to think about. You know, cause, uh, I, I actually you mean I get remember. Back to? I, I think you mean get back to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> whatever. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like uh, you're talking about the indie game movie uh, Ed Mc- McMullen or uh, Blue Baby. Some people know him. Um, he created Binding of Isaac. And even even Super Meat Boy, uh, I mean, got a little bit of flack just because of, you know, Dr. Fetus um, or, you know, in, in, in Binding of Isaac, there was that whole uh, religious statement that they that they put into it. So, you know, I, I could I cannot see any kind of AAA company wanting to uh, until until it got popular already, you know, where it got put on like Xbox Live and stuff like that. Uh, but they wouldn't take that chance on it. So. So we as gamers now have these new expectations where where we want something new, not necessarily just another freaking sequel to, you know, we, the, the, the 25th uh, Assassin's Creed Iteration. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's how it's evolved. Uh, do you guys have any any other ideas of, of that or should we move on to to the awesome games? I'm. I, it, it feels okay. I'm okay with moving on. Like I, I said my piece, the, the community that getting back that sense of community yeah. that it was the biggest thing for me. I love you guys. This, this, this whole week has been just, I, I've not oh. left my computer. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, with that said, I think we'll move on. What, uh, we normally do on our, on our show is actually, we have, uh, different segments. We start off with news. We go through and spotlight uh, a, a completed, like a fully released indie game that we think is amazing. We also spotlight uh, a game that, that might need some help on green light or Kickstarter or, uh, or is there, or is an early access. And then we'll spotlight, uh, um, just real quickly, a, a free game that isn't, you know, just, uh, the, the one millionth tower defense game or something like that um but it's since, really good yeah so but for the indie 3 edition of the game uh, of the indie game riot um we're doing uh something a little different we have we came up with different categories that we think are important uh aspects in indie games um and we picked some of the games that you guys uh, throughout the whole week we've been asking for you guys to to send us links via twitter or email uh to your games uh either demos or, or you some of you have been kind enough to give us keys um or even just the trailers and uh we've picked out of the ones that we've played we've we we picked uh what games we felt met the or did the best in, in each of these categories save for a couple of them that that didn't need us to necessarily play to to play in order and there to, was, to get it there was a lot of argument going back and forth on it <laughs> like like up until this morning at like 10 o'clock a.m pacific time uh we were still like no let's put this game there no 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 we've got to put this game there and it's uh, like we were having full-on arguments amongst each other you know as to as to who we would and then we finally decided no we're gonna we're gonna make the cutoff here but i think we've got a really good list here for everybody yeah. so it was about to turn into VH1 behind the podcast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where are you uh, now? Um, yeah. So we do want to we do want to caveat this. Uh, this is not an official indie three list. You know, this isn't sponsored by or anything like this. This is just me and Josh talking back and forth, uh, and this is the 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 cream of, as I said, the awe inspiring crop from our perspective right and and these games are amazing in, in by themselves and, and we pick them specifically for these categories but that does not mean if the game doesn't show up on this list because phil mentioned uh a game that uh we were very close to putting on this list but but didn't it's still an amazing game but we just didn't feel like it, it, it fit into any one specific category that was um what, what was it uh query the scred th- yeah thank you Quar- queries of this of the scred um it was, it was just an amazing game. It just didn't get put on the list. So just because it's not on the list, it's still awesome games. You should nominated. Oh. It was one of yeah. the nominated games. Yeah, I don't yeah. mention. Um, but first off, uh, since we have Phil here, we the first thing was level design, and it's it's uh, which is extremely important to to any game. Uh, we picked we picked Phil's super Pixalo not because he's on the show, but because he has 
for for a platformer, um, it's specifically level design is extremely important for the flow and for the challenge. And uh, we picked Phil's game um, because uh, he uses symmetry and patterns, um, which obviously play a large part uh, in in the platformer style. And um, and uh, along with the obstacles and and with a game that that's that's really challenging like his there's lots of deaths but he he creates the levels in a way that it keeps the player going they don't get frustrated like oh man i gotta start like like two hours ago back where you know at this last save point um that sort of thing and and it his his symmetry in the games just create this really nice flow throughout all of the levels back to back similar to, to another awesome platformer super meat boy so phil do you have any like uh any comments on like how you were able to achieve that um <laughs> now that you're on the spot <laughs> now that i'm on the spot uh um really well it was more of an approach than like there was an, any kind of methodology or even design theory. Uh, like I tried to get into on Tuesday a design theory, but I realized it's not. There wasn't really a design theory. It was more like there was a, a approach I wanted to take in a um, in a process of how I did that. So with any game that's going to be frustrating, you probably don't want to like make it so that you're frustrating the player and then you're like taking away everything they worked for. So mm-hmm. bite-sized pieces. And so I wanted to break apart, you know, with, with super pixel, it's, it's, it's a kind of a rage game. Uh, it's a little funky. You, you slide around a lot more. Uh, you almost feel like you're a little less controlled. Um, and that's intentional. All the, everything, the physics, everything that's completely intentional. Um, and so working with that, I wanted to create something that kind of like you were getting these bite-sized pieces where you were getting these challenging smaller levels that you could keep building up and having kind of more of a sine curve of up and down rather than just a, you know, a 90 degree angle of difficulty. Right. And so you kind of go up and down in difficulty and things would get harder and add more game mechanics would be added. I didn't want to overwhelm the player. Um, and I didn't, I haven't heard anybody who felt like it was overwhelming to jump in. And, and I think my intention was to make it so you could sit down at any time and jump in and play it, uh, whether you kind of let it go for a few weeks or like you could just go in, play like a level or two and then go back and, and, you know, not play it or whatever. I mean, whatever works for you. Like I, I really wanted to create a game that let the player play however they wanted, whatever mode they're comfortable in within the, you know, confines and, and of creating a game. Rev, yeah, Rev right. you, you, you actually had, uh, added something in the notes about, um, about the iteration between success and failure. Um, you want to talk about oh, that real quick? Yeah. Something, something that I noticed through both in the trailer, uh, we, I watched some of, the I can't think of his name right now or her name right now, but, uh, their, their stream, uh, of Super Pixalo. Um, but something that I noticed was that it was a very quick iteration between su- su- success and failure. Sorry, I'm three beers in. I don't broadcast sober. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, success and failure. Aren't you and, a reverend? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the, the rapidity between, you know, oh, I screwed up and I just fell through an electric panel that that fried me and I'm right back into the game allows the player to experiment with the tactics and experiment with the physics and your little rounded blocks and and what kind of jumps you're going to go for, you know, things like that allows the player to experiment their their gameplay uh, without a real fear of failure, because there there are games where it's you know legitimately like I've I've played campaigns of Dark Souls where it, you've gone for hours and you've gotten to this spot and suddenly you die and it's like you know that just wiped out four and a half hours worth of my game and I just get frustrated with it like it's a hard game and I like it but I just get frustrated with the lack of progress because I misblocked or misparried something like that. And, and I've, I've really become lately a, a big fan of the quick iteration games. Um, uh, uh, one, one of the ones uh, he was, he was just on an interview before us. 
um, was uh, was the uh, concurrence, uh, very rapid iteration in in play, but Super Pixalo and and its ancestor, I guess, uh, Pixalo was very very rapid. You were if you died, if, if you fried, if you died, you were you were right back within a second or so, and, and to me, in conjunction with the level design itself. It was a fantastic aspect to it. it. It really drew me in, and and that's kind of why I put this here, or, or agreed to put Super Pixalo here. Um, and and we, just to push through a little bit too, I, we could talk about all these games for days and days. But you know, we don't want to we don't want to spend you know the entire night talking about uh, just one thing. So um, you next the next segment on the list, or the next category, I should say, is is sound design. And you picked uh, Rev. You actually put, you picked this one, Chronicles of a Dark Lord, Tides of Fates. Um, so why don't you tell us why you picked that? Okay, so a lot of a lot of games, all, all games really rely on, or or can rely on their soundtrack and and their their sound design in order to bring across the feel of the game. What really drew me to this one was that you're not actually playing a hero. Uh, this isn't the hero's journey. You're not you're you're not Link setting out on the adventure to save Hyrule. You're actually the big bad evil guy of the game. Like the game starts with you committing genocide or patricide rather and and wiping out an opposing army and taking over the world and then your game really starts. And the way that they manage to kind of reinforce that feeling of you are a villain not a hero was through their music. I, I sat there and I literally minimized the game and just listened to the music for about an hour or so. And there was this ongoing, like, it, it was it was very good and it was energetic at times, but the music of it just built in this sense of darkness and forbidding. Like, the first time you hear Imperial March and Empire Strikes Back, you know, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Oh. And, and that just kind of helped reinforce the, the fact that I'm not a good guy here. <laughs> and... and I liked that. I loved that. It wasn't light and happy and and you know let's go let let's go save the princess. It was no. I'm here to be evil and bad, and, and that is my goal. And and real quick, I don't know who's responsible for the uh, great old one in the chat said it, he wanted the the link to the game. So if if anyone has, uh, I don't know if you have a rev since you're a mod, you can actually make it clickable. But um, put the links to the games that we talk about in the chat so everyone can check them out. I can put the title of the games, and if uh, I'll I'll post a, a link to the full list. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have one on hand. Yeah, um, yeah, we definitely want to get that because they deserve the attention. Um, so Rev, Rev will take care of that. The next one uh, you put on this list. Yeah, the next one I put on this list is uh, for simplicity. Simplicity isn't something that really uh, has to be in all games, but it really. Um, the, the simplicity often makes a good game because it, once it gets it starts, it's if a game starts to get convoluted, uh, it can it can make it just really frustrating for the gamer. Um, and it, the simplicity of a game really allows the gamer to uh, to to concentrate on other aspects, uh, you know, such as the story. Um, the, you know, you you start to immerse yourself with the music and, and the art and everything like that. Um, and the, the the game that I picked, um, and this is where we were thinking about putting. Uh, Corey's a scred, um, but you know that's a really simple game as opposed to a, a, a deep game with a simple mechanic, which is really impressive. Is called Children of Liberty. You guys see, you guys have seen that um, in the stream already, I believe. <clears throat> and it's it's a stealth game that that I can literally play with one hand. Um, they usually when you play stealth games, I mean, think of think of um, uh, what's a good stealth game? You know, like Splinter Cell. Splinter Cell, uh, and and I, I am having so many brain farts, I can't even, I don't know. But you get what I'm saying. Um, I can play this with one hand, and uh, the reason that the simplicity is important, I, I mentioned before, uh, is because I can get engrossed into that story. And that's it's that's what that game is really focusing on um, outside of the, the stealth mechanic. Is is it's It reminds me a lot of like uh, some of those uh, like young adult young adult uh novels where uh you know there's like a group of meddlesome kids getting back at these uh evil adults and that's it's it's back in the um 
it's back in like the 1700s yeah 1700s where where these kids are are thwarting uh the quote quote evil british uh soldiers so that's why that's why i chose, chose children of liberty and you played it too rev right uh i i did but my laptop is uh is six years old and has been through multiple deployments to the middle east uh before it g- came into my possession so uh i was watching both indy 3 and indy 4 <laughs> streams while trying to play it and I, my laptop kind of died but what i did see of it was <laughs> like i got to the i got to the first corner and i got past the first guards and, and then my laptop just like fried on me so um, yeah. I, I, I I want to play more once uh, once ND3 is is done with uh, Monday I'll probably power off my laptop for the first time in a week and uh, let it cool down and then uh, give it a go again but yeah. uh, no it, from from what I played of it the 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 mechanic being so easy to understand so so easy to implement added a layer to the game that just it, it allowed me to just Oh, for what little I could, I'll I'll, I'll be honest. And but, and just a, a quick note on that too is that the game is in really really early access, so uh, you know it's going to be buggy. Don't judge it based on that. You know all you, all you game devs know out there, obviously, um, to not judge it on on the early builds. But go check it out just to see what we're talking about. Like it's literally you know just just shift control and WASD um, that I had to use in in EU every once in a while. Um, now. Just to move on, trying to push through this, uh, you had the you had the next category. Right? Uh, yeah, the next category is animation. Uh, not all games require animation. To, you know, don't 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 take this the wrong way. But animation can play a huge role in how your game brings it across. And I know we're kind of like preaching to the choir, but I'm not a game dev myself. And so for me, going through all of this is, has definitely helped me understand your guys' process even more. Um, but the game that I chose for, for animation was one called Savage, the Shard of Ghosts. And we've seen that uh, showcased at least once. And uh, the reason I picked that was the the game was definitely going for... That, that old school SNES action platformer type feel. And uh, they they nailed it perfectly. The aspect ratio, they, they even had the, the screen flicker the, that you saw on the old tube TVs. I, I don't know if you're old enough to remember those, Josh. I, um, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember tube TVs, trust me. Okay, so, so they, you know, they had, uh, they, like, the, everything about that, caught the feel and out of all of the games that i saw so far this week um that uh that that has gone for a seriously retro look this one has so perfectly encapsulated what they were going for that i had to have a special mention on this yeah and um just okay. If there's so much to talk about these things, but we got to move. <laughs> we got to push through these things. Um, the next one is art and stylization, um, art direction. Uh, the game that I chose is We Need to Go Deeper. This is one that we didn't actually get to play because there's not a, a playable version out yet, unfortunately. But I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we Need to Go Deeper is by uh, Delhi Interactive, and they. It's a, it's a co-op game where you're basically operating a submersible in a Jules Verne style universe uh, down to the bottom of this trench with these crazy creatures and everything like that. And you got to survive um, with the help of your friends. Um, the reason that we chose this for art uh, is because the the stylization is very striking. It's 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 reminds me a bit a bit of steampunk and and very heavily Jules Verne. Um, you know, we, when you think Jules Verne, it's it's slightly dark, but it's a little bit cartoony in this game. Uh, so it's enough to be uh, lighthearted and have some humor in it. Um, and even though even though the the colors are darker tones, it's still really eye catching. That because I remember I actually saw it uh, initially um, in the first or second day of the of the indie game spotlights <clears throat> with the trailers and everything. I was like immediately, I was like, like what is that? I want to play it. Um, so that's. That in itself, just for marketing purposes, uh, is really important. Um, but the other thing is that art really adds to the ambience of the game and, and it immerses you even more. And it, uh, other than telling you what the game is about at first glance, it really helps you um, get an idea of the story itself as well. And the theme, the theme. Right. right. Right, and the theme, and like I said, Jules Verne, uh, it's very heavily inspired by by the Jules Verne, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and that's immediately what you think 
unless you don't know who Jules Verne is, um, that's immediately what you think when you when you see the art style of this game. Uh, uh, yeah, do we want to? It, it's we got about fifteen minutes uh, mm-hmm. at this point. Um, I I'm trying to stick it to the to that hour mark. We were told we could go a little bit over, but we definitely right. want to give some time to this. We're gonna do one last one, mm-hmm. and uh, and then we'll we'll move on to our next little segment. Um, the uh, the last one that we're going to talk about is uh, is our favorite trailer from from Indie Three so far, and uh, I have to say this this was uh, an excellent trailer. Uh, if you get the opportunity, go check it out. It is Fiesta Tango, and uh, you know I I chose it because it it ultimately it was it was one of the best trailers that that laid everything out it it showed gameplay it set the expectation of the game through the narration uh you know it it gave you a sense of the the humor it was hilarious and uh you know just kind of talking about why that can be important when you're when you're promoting the game you know i'm just a consumer that that's ultimately all i am of of games and you know having a having a good trailer to say hey this is what we're doing this is what we're going for and how it's going to play you know we've we've seen jo- josh made a note in here we've seen a ton of you know triple a trailers that have set this amazing expectation you know this is everything and it's awesome and it'll it'll wash your cat and do the dishes as well and <laughs> and, and then you get the game and you're i'm really disappointed with this um and it, it's almost duplicitous uh I, I think is the word i'm going for there uh deceptive uh, and this one like i i've not seen any deceptive trailers this entire digicon and uh <laughs> we've seen a lot of them but this one just so perfectly encapsulated everything that i was looking for in just a couple of moments right um well, yeah, so that's the last uh, that's the last category that we're going to do. We don't really have time for some of the other ones. Um, the last one was like writing, but we didn't actually pick anyone for that, so don't worry. We're not we're not skipping out <laughs> we're on anyone. We're just going to talk on that yeah. one uh, because it's important too in some games. But anyway, um, up next we actually have an interview with James Morgan, who is the president of the Indie Box. Um, if you don't know what the Indie Box is, it's very it's 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 a uh, subscription based box that you can get in to uh, get through the mail. If you guys haven't heard, there's a, uh, you know, there's like loot crate and things like that. Very similar, but this is very uh, specifically to- aimed towards uh, indie games and supporting them. So if, uh, if we can uh, bring on James, come on All down right. this time for real. <laughs> yeah. For real this time. All right, here we go. Have at it. Hey James, how's it going? You got to unmute yourself, buddy. <laughs> there it is. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yeah, there we go. Hey, how are you doing, James? I'm doing fine. I was actually listening to the stream whenever uh, you guys got into me, so I was like, "Oh no, I'm hearing two different voices." <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, we hopefully we can we can push this a little bit past the hour point because you know, nudge nudge, uh, Edmund. <laughs> but because uh, we want to give we want to give James as much time as possible to to talk about the indie box and and as well as his opinions on the indie game community. Um, but first, why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about the company and, and uh, just explain to everyone what it is? Okay, great. So indie box is a subscription service, sort of like a cheese of the month club or wine of the month club or book of the month club sort of thing where um, basically you know that you like cheese or in this case video games. And so you sign up and every single month we create this collector's edition version of an indie game that has either uh, just come out or about to be released. And we pack it full of all the stuff that you remember back um, back in the day when they were still making box video games, like manual, like full color manuals, soundtracks, game cartridges, stickers, another swag like that. And uh, we ship it right to your door every single month. Yeah, and actually, and I think you had uh, a little announcement before we go into the questions for for the listeners tonight. Absolutely. We are going to be giving away a free indie box tonight. And if you want to be in the running to win one of those, we have a special hashtag that we always use for like Twitter and and Facebook, which is hashtag bring back the box. So if you want to be in the running, just 
send out a tweet that um, kind of links to IndieBox or, or the Indie E3 that we have going on right now. Make sure you use the hashtag bring back the box. And at the end of the uh, show tonight, whether it's at the top of the hour or whatever, we will pick a random uh, tweet that has that hashtag in it and award them a free, uh, free indie box. Excellent. And it, it, you mentioned, um, you mentioned having that, uh, one specific indie game every month. Um, but what is the indie box's mission as far as, um, supporting these indie developers? Because I, I, we, we read a, uh, an article. That's how we found out about the indie box. Um, a, uh, about a month ago, I would say. Yeah. That and happens. yeah. And, uh, we, we saw how much you really wanted to support the indie game community and indie devs in, in, in general. So, um, what, what exactly is, is your company's mission? We actually have two missions. Uh, the first one is to, like I just mentioned, to bring back the feeling of getting a box game and it not suck. Uh, the, for, the, the games you get nowadays are like glorified cases. There's one disc in there, make two or whatever. But the, other than that, you've got like a half folded sheet of paper that has a control scheme. There's no story background. There's no character bios on, on the enemies or your main character or anything like that. It's just... It's lame. There's no cool stuff in in boxes anymore. And if you want that cool stuff, you're looking at about $100 a box just to get a quote-unquote collector's edition. Oh, yeah. And, and so we, we feel like that's, that's kind of weak. And so we're trying to bring back the box, like I said. Uh, the second part of our mission is to, in the process of creating those boxes, support indie game developers. So what we do, is, and we're very uh, open about how we monetize and all that, is um, every month we basically just create this box and whatever materials um however much that costs we take that away from what we make every month and whatever is on top of that we count that as pure profit and so we we split that amount of money 50 50 with our with our game developer and we pay for um salaries or advertising or or conferences and all that for for indie box and then the rest of it goes to the indie developers for uh i don't know ramen and beer or whatever they choose to do with it Right. And um, Rev, actually, that leads into one of one of Rev's questions about uh, <laughs> about how your working conditions at the moment. So a, a, a month ago, when we first found out about this, we were doing some research into you guys and uh, we've, we came across maybe some old marketing material that basically said there were two of you working in somebody's garage. Uh, is that still the case? Has that changed? Um, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> we were never working in my garage. It's more like my living room. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and we started out as three people. Technically, um, there are two people that are kind of like on the bank account, but three people founded the company. And, um, I have an amazing programmer. His name's Jason Blank. And then, um, our marketing director is, uh, Jason Hex Carter, who, uh, is sort of like a local celebrity here in Orlando for putting on a, a monthly, or excuse me, a yearly concert called Nerdapalooza. And uh, they'd always have like these nice nerdy geek bands come in and like they might be giants, stuff like that. And uh, it was huge for a number of years and we brought him on board as well. And so we've got a nice round team. Uh, but right now we're actually at about eight people and we're all working volunteer hours on this and uh it's basically a labor of love on nights and weekends that's awesome actually that, and that's another thing too i mean other than the fact that you split the profits with the dev is it's just that you are working with on this with with passion it's not just to make money um obviously you want to support your family but you're doing it because of the love for the indie game and the love for you know the physical copies that you used to get back in the day um, and, uh, you actually have some, uh, criteria for the games, um, correct that, that, that you, uh, yeah, to, we, in order to, want we to have know. a very strict criteria for each one of our games. Uh, the first one is it has to be compatible with windows, Mac and, and Linux. There's no exceptions. If you don't have a game that's a, that's compatible with all three of those, then, uh, we don't make a subscriber box for you. Uh, we also have a specific rating that you have to be uh, above on either Steam or um, NDDB.com. And that basically just assures all of our subscribers that you're going to get a certain level of quality of game. We're not just going to throw a crap game in there and charge you, uh, you know, $15, $16 a month for it. It's not fair. 
And we also require things like a, a custom soundtrack. Original soundtrack will always be packed in the box. Um, and then we also require that the game has to have been released within six months of the time that uh, you start talking to us. And the reason we we say that within the time that you start talking to us is sometimes uh, we have developers contact us and they have a phenomenal game and we want to feature them. However, we've we've already booked like three months out. And so there is a possibility where, um, you know, you might get a game that's a little, six, seven months old, but um, it's a game that when we first started working this deal, it was pretty new. And we want to make sure that people aren't already owning the game or at least have the best chance for not owning the game uh, when they get the box. And and Phil, you've been quiet all day, too. You had a, you had a question about uh, the, this kind of subject. I've been down on my beers. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, my question is: Is uh, when so when you have multiple games that uh, meet that criteria, um, that multiple games that want to partner with you, and and you're trying to fit that schedule together? What do you do? You like agonize over which ones go in the queue first? Is it first come first serve? And then also like, do you ever do multiple games, or is it just one game, one feature? Like, how does that all work? It's one game a month, but I'll tell you that this week, probably the last two weeks, are the first time that we've actually had to agonize, and um, it has been rough. I mean, the first few months that we were in operation, we were basically pitching concepts to indie developers, and so we're like on our knees begging, please let us feature your game. We're going to make a box copy, and uh, you know, we just obviously since we had nothing come out and we were brand new. And we're totally indie funded, like as in self funded. Um, it was really hard to get content. And now that we had our first box come out, we've had a lot of reception, and we we've had a lot of developers come to us and say, "We want boxes. You know, give us give us a uh, collector's edition boxes." So we've already started filling out. Almost, I think we're already filled out for the rest of the year uh, with games and. We're already working on a super secret squirrel project for all the other games that have been contacting us that that want physical editions as well. So like an indie three uh, custom box set just for for like all the indie three games. Um, sort of. We're not ready to reveal a bunch of plans uh, about it yet, but um, just know that all these awesome indie games that are being developed, we're coming up with plans for those guys too. Okay. So, uh, got a, another question for you, and this is one that I, I always, I always want to know what inspired this. So, if if you can think back into the distant past, what exactly was it you were doing when you had the this brilliant idea for Indie Box? Like, were you sitting around a pizza shop, you know, sh- sharing some pepperoni pizza? Were you sitting on a sofa playing a video game? What what were you doing at the moment that you guys conceptualized and and went, "No, this would be a great idea. We're going to make it happen." Uh all I have to give it all to um, our marketing director, Hex Carter. He's he's the one that came in. We used to work together, and he came in one day and said, guys, I had this idea. It woke me up at 3 a.m., and I have to tell you about it. And it originally came up as something like a an indie subscription service, sort of like uh, a Netflix, if you will. And um, we started talking about, well, okay, that that's really cool. But how else can we entice people to join this? Because really, just renting software um, is something that Steam or Desora or GOG could immediately turn on at any given second, and and we'd be out of business. So what can we do that they're not in the business of doing? And so we talked about the nostalgia factor, and over about a course of two weeks, we developed into this physical product. And um, yeah, the rest is history, man. It was it was crazy. Excellent. Uh, Josh, you got a, you got another question or we, well, actually let's, we, we've got one from yeah. the audience. Um, it, it, Svetlana, uh, wanted to know if dev demand increases to indie box, uh, would you ever increase the rate at which you release the boxes or perhaps increase the number of boxes released at once? Um, yes, we've talked about doing a couple of different things. Uh, number one would be, um, removing the restriction of the Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Well, well, here's why. <laughs> the The reason being is because 
Windows has some great games. Mac has some great games. Linux has great games, but it's really hard. And so the ability to um, allow people to specify what operating system they have would allow us to broaden our horizon on what games we we could include. I'm not completely sold on it. Uh, it's something we've been kicking around. But fate, like I said, phase two that we're working on has a solution for every indie game in the world. Um, and we're really happy to, to start working with uh, more developers right now. Excellent. In fact, if you are an indie developer <laughs> hint, hint. and you want to have your game in an indie box, please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, this, is, this is me getting in touch with you. <laughs> Hi, my name's James. My name's Phil. I have a game. Uh, you know, Phil, we you, should talk you, after you, this. You, Definitely. You two lovebirds. You two lovebirds can 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 discuss that later. <laughs> uh, the well, uh, one other thing before. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure we're, we're getting like right at the end of the hour, so I don't know how long extra we can go. You, just let us know if you uh, want us to wrap it up uh, at some point, but um, we can do this I all will... night, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, oh, and I'm talking to the admins too, because I don't know how long they want to stay up. Uh, so just let us know whoever is responsible for that. But uh, my, my question is um, one of the things that I love about the box is that each box has uh, its own, uh, own piece of art for the for the game um the one tesograd that you have uh, released already you had uh, a piece of art commission correct that is correct uh we yeah. had uh dan jones who is a phenomenal artist he's actually been featured by kotaku a number of times as well yeah he uh I, that's one of my favorite things i mean even the box is collectible and the art is fantastic and i know you said too that if the uh dev you know ha has a specific artist or if they did the art they they could maybe try and work something out too but um dan jones he he did an amazing job with tesograd and uh who who come you already said who comes up with the idea but how do you know how he how he comes up with that the idea for the box art we look at different artists and in the case of dan jones uh we already knew him personally and we basically going forward have looked at different artists that we've either heard of or we're admirers of their work and we honestly we just kind of cold email them and say hey we're working on this we love your art style and it's exactly what we feel would be perfect for xbox coming up um no pun intended about xbox <laughs> and and we say look it's this game and we'd love to have a cover modeled after this piece that you've done as far as the color usage or shading or you know the the style that you've done um would you be interested and we offer them basically a contractor deal that um offers them either you know like lifetime not lifetime but like a year subscription of indie box or you know we can pay them in in cash and um most of the time they are so just enamored by the idea of an indie box that they're like, yeah, I'll take the subscription. That sounds awesome. I'll do it for free basically. So we've, we've had great responses and we're going to continue the trend of doing custom collectors art because um, you know, to me that that is what nostalgia is for the old boxes. Um, um, so now that we've talked about the, the company a little bit, uh, just some quick questions about your personal thoughts on the indie game community. Um, since that that's what this whole convention is about, is just bringing uh, you know all of us together. Um, let me get my list. Of what, uh, what what got you interested? What would you say? In what, what do you think is your favorite aspect, the best aspect of the indie gaming? Uh, say that one more time. I'm sorry, I was getting a lot of feedback. Oh yeah, what what is your what, what is your favorite or or you know what do you think the best aspect is of the indie gaming community? Uh, I think the camaraderie is is the best part. I mean, it it's a classic um, like classic tale. Like everyone is super small, and so everyone that's super small bands together to to try to. Uh, beat out the big guys and I love that I obviously live in Orlando and it's a town that's riddled with indie studios like small studios or student studios that are just starting out graduating from like Full Sail or DeVry or whatever and everyone is trying to start a studio and it's like a huge community down here and then we've got the one big EA studio which is Tiburon that does the Madden games and 
it's it's so crazy to to just hear about and visit with any developers that are trying to make their way and um everyone that works in that community is always sharing stories or you know just helpful hints back and forth it's it's phenomenal and from what i understand it's it's like that all over the world and and what we've seen with um indiebox we've all of our developers so far have been um international so i'm up at you know 4 a.m working with people in norway or or sweden or something like that and they're all just super helpful like what can we do to help you and like to me that is the best clientele to have in a business is people that understand and get the product and they're excited to be a part of it not just okay yes i'll have my sony build out as soon as possible and yeah. hopefully you'll put it on the front page and not screw me over yeah, that same the same stuff day after day in the indie the indie community just it's new and fresh all the time. God, I love it. <laughs> yeah, um, it is. Rev, uh, it looks like it looks like Solon's giving us some extra time. So, uh, you know, bonus <laughs> okay. show. Oh yeah, bonus, uh, bonus. <laughs> so we so can we can actually ask uh, all the questions that we that we have. Um, Rev, why don't you why don't you ask one of yours? So uh, specifically, like uh, indie gaming, uh, what. Once you're part of the indie game community, the scene, uh, then you kind of shake your head and, and go, like, how, how did I not know about this? But if you weren't aware of it um, prior to, the, the whole indie scene is kind of this mystery of nothingness. Um, you know, every once in a while you get some breakout like uh, Super Meat Boy or Fez or something like that that gets a lot of publicity and, and everybody goes, oh, that's really cool. And then it kind of fades back into the distance. So what specifically was it that got you, James, interested into the whole indie scene? I actually was an indie developer um, back in the day, which was about five years ago. Uh, <laughs> I started out at a... Um, a client services studio making DS games for tween girls. So my, <laughs> my first title and claim to fame was uh, a game where basically you spent all your time in high school in the mall and the biggest mechanic was about gossiping. Uh, so <laughs> so kind of like real life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I quickly thought, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I started jumping from indie studio to indie studio and eventually even started uh, an indie studio myself with a financial backer called Sky Parlor Studios, and we did a bunch of uh, mobile titles. And uh, eventually, it fizzled out. The indie scene is very hard, especially on mobile. And so, uh, you know, I I quickly realized that uh, the gaming industry, whether you're indie or you're working for AAA studios or something like that. If you're in this industry, you're in it because you love it. Because it's sure not about the salary, and it's sure not about the stability. So. I I have a huge passion for indie and anything that I can do um, with my skill set, which is not art, it's not programming, it, it's definitely not music or anything like that. So anything I can do with my skill set to help out people that are are trying to live their dream, that's that's why I created Inbox. That's why I work so hard for this. And indie gamers unite. Um, yeah. So I mean, did you have? <laughs> I, I mean, any other uh, tween games that might have inspired you, or or what 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 indie games tween really? Games? Did, <laughs> yeah, uh, what what indie games actually did inspire you to um, to get into it? Uh, I I was a big fan at first of all of the uh, the mainstream indie games. You mentioned Super Meat Boy. Like we mm. still play that at like when we go to different uh, shows promoting indie box. Sometimes we'll load up Super Meat Boy and just have it and get frustrated. And so a lot of the mainstream indie games, AAA indie, I guess you could call it, uh, those are yeah. the ones that really got me into um, into noticing more and more indie games. And then, um, you know, Indie Box really turned me on to all of the smaller games that uh, I won't say smaller in scope or in passion or gameplay, but just smaller in terms of their recognition. There are a lot of indie yeah. games out there that are phenomenal but you just don't hear about them because either the developers are or there's like one or two developers and they're not worried about advertising their game they're just trying to create something great or you know they're just they don't have the big communities yet those games are just as great as the ones that you hear about on steam on front page and and so i'm yeah <laughs> i don't know what else i can say about that man i i love all indie games 
I'm I'm actually kind of running dry on questions. Uh, well, well, how we can uh, Phil, yeah. maybe wrap it up right. the next five minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I yeah. have a topic for you guys if, uh, uh, if you want if you something, want something to, talk to talk about. about. Okay. Sure. So one of the things that um, I noticed in mobile, and I'm noticing it happening more and more over the last year or so in indie com- in the indie community, is uh, the race to the bottom. And right now, if you if you take out your phone and someone says, you should buy this game, if you notice that it's more than 99 cents, you have to think about it. And you look at the screenshots, you read the descriptions, and we're seeing that same principle happen to Steam and Desura and GOG, where uh, even though an indie game looks phenomenal, you're going to wait till, till summer. You're going to wait till that, the Christmas sale. Christmas sale, that's right. And you're going to buy 30 indie games at once at $2 a piece, and they're going to sit on your virtual shelf and you're never going to play them. And so I'd love to know what you guys think about this whole paradigm shift of creating something that you put your heart and soul into and then allowing a publisher to devalue it in the long run to a $2 game. And how do you feel about that? Josh, can I lead on this one? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So I, uh, I, I operate off a limited budget myself. Um, I'm, I'm currently between jobs and uh, taking care of a family and all that fun stuff. So my, my discretionary funds are relatively limited. Um, that being said, I, I don't wait for sales. And even on the get like, I, hmm, without getting myself in trouble my my wife is circling the living room going seriously can we get the living room back um but uh without getting myself in trouble just during the course of this uh this conference uh convention i have probably spent all of my discretionary funds on indie games um i buy them at full price when i can and if they're no longer at full price i buy multiple copies you know uh uh, I, i bought a copy of of concursion last night and for me and one to to gift to josh because he's kind of in the same got a family and and all of that situation uh you know i bought probably 12 different copies of fez at 10 bucks a piece i bought it on the 360 i bought it on steam i gifted copies to people you know i had a random coworker that was like oh i heard that there was something called a fez so i bought him a copy on steam and was like you have to play this right now um so for for me personally i don't necessarily like the race to the bottom but i think that if you're going to go for a specific price point there needs to be the content to back that uh just recently we were uh we we were talking about a game that uh that that was released that was uh uh, i think at the time it was selling for seven dollars and the problem that i had with that was or no i'm sorry it was 9.99 um it was i played through the entire game twice and it took me 35 minutes like from beginning to end and i had 100 percent completed the game twice in 35 minutes and i think that there's a bit of uh have a little bit more content to the game uh in fact my recommendation to that developer when we recorded that episode was you know you also released the soundtrack with it i would pay 15 dollars for the soundtrack and game bundled and and you know rather than paying separately for the soundtrack and separately for the game it, it's the concept the idea of the content that that really makes the price worth it yeah, so making I, sure that you have a good ratio of of uh, of content, the amount of stuff that um, you have to entertain the player, and then and then how long it's going to take him to do. Because you also have to like you can't just gear that and base that time off of um, uh, how long it takes you to play stuff uh, based on your skill level or fast people's skill level. Like you want to make sure that they're getting the most value because they're the most likely to play your whole game through. Um, but you also have to keep in mind the different like levels of game players. Like if I handed my handed a game to my little sister, it would probably probably take her months to get through like Super Pixello. But if I hand it to you know someone like uh, Reverend, um, he'd probably get through it in a day. And 
so it's 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 trying to find that balance it's trying to build that relationship with your audience um i personally think that um there's a higher chance that people will buy your game because i buy these games uh if you are constantly adding improving um and interacting with the community around your game uh, I've, I've been seeing this a lot with duck game um, by landon Poblowski on the ouya um very like a ton i think there's already been like three updates since launch um he's got he's you know constantly talking on twitter about new things that he's adding improving on the game's already fantastic but he's still building and making it better and so that's driving sales um at least that's what appears it's is happening and i think it is happening because it's a great game so yep yeah it, and real quick before we actually wrap it up um because i'm sure they're like tapping their feet <laughs> <laughs> logic's uh, over there i'm gonna give them the boot <laughs> yeah yeah um but i my thoughts on it is i think that i i am guilty of of, of buying some games when they're on sale because mainly because i don't have the boot money. this if man I, <laughs> if if <laughs> If I had the money, if I had the money, I would absolutely buy it for full price. Um, I think that depending on the game too, because when they're on sale, um, people feel less, you know, they feel like it's less of a risk. So would you rather have someone, you know, buy it for, you know, 25% off or, or whatever, 50% off or not buy it at all? In that case, for for some of the smaller indie, indie games that might not get a lot of, uh, uh, of love as far as pl- publicity goes. Um and I don't know. I I think I think if 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 you have the money, definitely definitely do it. But um, I don't think it's it's a hundred percent terrible. Although I I do think some of the like the Christmas sales and things like that seventy five percent off for seventy five percent off. I mean I've seen like uh, seen games like Fez go for like three bucks, and I think that's a little bit low for for, yeah, for a anyone. little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep, yep, yep. Let's give away an indie box. Yeah, yeah let's, let's, let's give away an indie box, Jay. Logic, just a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all right, you've got 30 seconds. Okay, James, give away okay. the indie box. All right, so we had a whopping two people use the hashtag Harris and Set, uh, uh, Svetlana. Uh, did, you, did you add in the non capitalized version as well? Because I saw a lot of those. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> while, while he's searching, too, uh, you can find the, the our, if you're interested in our podcast, it's all over the place on YouTube. Just search at YouTube. And of course, you know, Twitter, re- Facebook, Reddit, website, email, all that sort of stuff. So go check it out. And yeah, uh, our, our our podcast is uh, at IGR Podcast on Twitter. Uh, same thing for Facebook. And uh, our podcast is currently uh, hosted on Josh's YouTube channel, and that's at Josh and Yacht Gaming. Um, just search for Josh and Yacht. It should pop up. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, I see lots of people now. Cool. Let's, <laughs> let's pick one at random. Here we go. Two people were both about to go home very happy. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right. So we've got Naig Hakari Yami. Okay. All right. All right. You win. So congratulations. You are getting Who's one that? month of IndieBot. <laughs> um, and uh, do we know which one's in the next one? No, it has not been announced yet. I'll tell you, it's an amazing game. You're going to love it. There's new swag in it that was not included in the last box. It's brand new, like designed and produced. It's going to be really awesome. Um, if you are that Hikari Yami gentleman or madam, please email james at theindiebox.com and we'll get you set up. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you guys for having me on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, no thanks, thanks for, for coming being here. on. Exactly. Thanks for coming on. And uh, guys, that's that's uh, Indie Game Riot Special Indie E3. And uh, enjoy the rest of our digital convention. I know I have, and uh, I look forward to a couple more days of awesome videos and games. Yeah, baby. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. This has been a riot. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that one before. Uh, we make that one before. <laughs> okay. All right. Great minds think alike, but fools seldom differ. Ah. 
Uh, but yeah, so we are going to go to a short intermission. And again, once again, thank you for everybody here for this podcast. And congratulations no to Naig Hikariyami, who won the subscription to IndieBox. But we are going to take a break and eat some dinner. And then we are going to be back at On The Hour for a live performance of, let's see if I can pronounce this, uh, Centris. That is it. And we're getting set up for that right now. So thank you for tuning in, everyone. And we'll be back in about 40 minutes on the hour with Centris. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner. See you guys.